The Spotlight, shining a light on podcasts and videos that have caught our attention. Hi, and welcome to The Spotlight. I'm Jen Spiker, and today I have another podcast that's worth sharing. There's a growing number of podcasts available on demand in the Vision app, which aren't heard on Vision Radio. One of those is Faith and Fostering, an Australian-made program where people of faith chat about foster care to encourage, edify and educate others on the journey. Each episode of Faith and Fostering is different. Sometimes it's an interview with a foster carer sharing their story. Other times it's focused on a particular topic relevant to people involved with fostering. Some episodes take more of a devotional approach. The episode I'm sharing today focuses on the National Foster Care Conference. The Spotlight with Jen Spiker. Harry with you today and we have the lovely Kirsty hailing from South Australia. Welcome Kirsty. Thanks, Jerry. You've just had a trip down to Hobart, Tasmania recently for the National Foster Care Conference. And yep, have indeed. <laughs> I thought it might be good uh, for those of us who couldn't make it down there. Yeah, just to kind of go through a little bit of, I guess, the conference from your experience, your eyes, what was valuable, what you took away. And, um, and it just kind of gives all of us a chance to, yeah, I guess, kind of get some insights into what's happening in Australia at those kind of events. So maybe if we just kind of dive right in and tell us, you know, even getting down there, how did you go leaving the family behind, <laughs> getting the accommodation, getting kind of settled? So um, this is the first national conference. that, and In fact, I think this is the first really big foster care conference that I've ever been to, Okay, which um, having been a carer for, you know, 12 years, I was like, why have I not done this before? <laughs> um I think some of it was that when we were in the absolute thick of um, working with high end trauma, it's really hard to get away, mm. uh, and so this may this kind of was an opportunity now to do that. So I actually um, our agency sent about ten carers. Wow! Um, so we were really fortunate because we were all expenses paid, oh, and that's it was so good. it was. I know, and we didn't have to. We didn't have to organise anything. Like basically, I got sent my flights, I got sent my accommodation. Um, so from that point of view, um, our agency every year puts out expressions of interest for various uh, things happening around Australia, and um, I hadn't ever really applied, and so I applied this year and um, and got selected. And it's a great group. We took uh, ten. 10 carers from our agency, which is Lutheran Care, and then we and then three staff came. Mm-hmm. So that was great. It was great to meet um, some other carers, people I hadn't met before. There were there was a wide range of carers. There was some that were brand new and um, you know nine or ten months into their very first placements. There were others that um, have you know been carers for longer. There was um, a carer there who does respite care, which is really important. And yeah. I love that she was recognised because I think sometimes we go, oh, they're just respite carers. Um, but it was great to have her along as well. Yeah. Um, there were some um, therapeutic carers. So it was a great group and it was great for me to be able to meet other other carers in our agency. Um, and we pretty much had a blast. Oh, it was great. I can <laughs> imagine. It's just it's kind of like people who – understand you, kind of understand the challenges. It's just a really um, affirming kind of environment, isn't it, to be yeah, it, in? it is. Um, so we flew down on the Wednesday night, which yeah. meant because that's the only direct flight from Adelaide is, um, is on Wednesday night. So that meant all day Thursday we had free. Oh, which was, that's great. Cause which it was is a three-day conference, wasn't it, like Thursday night, Friday, mm. oh, correct Well, me. Yeah, Thursday was kind of late and it was registration um, and the welcome and a cocktail party. Okay. So really not much on Thursday. Yeah. So we spent Thursday, everybody kind of, you know, went out and did their own thing and um, a group of us walked into Hobart and then oh, great. Um, one of my friends and I, we walked back along and looked at all the sculptures, the sculpture walk, and um, and then we'd actually pre-booked massages. So. <laughs> What a great idea. So we went, we went, we actually got those, you know, those scooters? Yeah, that, yeah. Um, yep. Never ridden one in my life before. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my gosh, let's just give it a go. And so we got on these scooters and we had so much fun riding back into Hobart to then go and have these massages. And so by the time we got to the cocktail party, we were just like, I am feeling really good now. <laughs> <laughs> I am relaxed. I am ready uh, to learn. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. 
Yeah, so kicked off with cocktail party, which was just an ability to um, mingle, meet people. And roughly, I mean, you might not know exactly, but what do you think the sort of attendance numbers were, just ballpark? I think some, I heard someone say around the four, 450 okay. at the maximum. Now, yeah. um, I think the cocktail party was really oversubscribed. They didn't expect so many people to turn up. Okay. And um, I had heard someone say that as well, that normally the cocktail party isn't, there isn't a lot of people that turn up, but there was a massive number that turned up. That's great. So I think maybe the venue had something to do with that because the casino is kind of stuck out on its own. Um, Probably lots of people were staying in that area Mm. and therefore they kind of went to the cocktail party. Oh, that's good because really that's often a place, like you were saying, being in that environment, meeting new people that you haven't met and building those connections (laughs) That makes a world of difference when you're in the thick of things, having some people Mm. that you know in the trenches alongside of you. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, meeting some of the people who are on the Facebook page that we have um, and putting some faces to those people and uh, and meeting some others who then we've added to the group now because they didn't know about the group. And I, yeah, I just think I also got to meet Stacey Blythe and we've done, you know, um, Stacey's done lots of research and um, so it was great to kind of finally put a face to her. I've spoken to her before. but Yeah, that's um, so good. Actually, I reached out to Stacey this week too and, um, yeah, she's going to be on a, an episode for us. So that's going to awesome. be so good. Awesome, yes. Then Friday morning mm-hmm. it all kind of kicked off. It kicked off with a keynote speaker who was Anne Hollands, who's the National Children's Commissioner. I think I've got that right. Yes. So that was great because it set that whole national tone. And Anne was great. She talked about uh, mental health, trauma, well-being and culture Mm. uh, being the important things for our children. Um, She also talked about the fact that we have almost a quarter of the Australian population uh, I think she said 24%, are children under 19. Wow. And yet we don't tap in and look at that quarter of our population when we're making policies and when there's decisions being made and, um, you know, most most things are made with adults in mind. Yeah. Does she just mean a quarter of the Australian population is in that age bracket? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. 20, 24%. Mm. Um, and they're largely not considered yeah when policies are made and you know because i think one of the things she said that really hit me was she said children don't vote yeah and so yeah no no one's really interested yeah um, well not no one we know there's lots of people who are interested in children but um i guess they're just they're just underrepresented in terms of when policies are being made and yeah she also talked about children who are not heard can't be protected yes and children who are silenced cannot be protected, and she spoke around that quite a bit, which was which was very interesting. Yeah, um, and I and I think we do need to listen to children more, and our politicians need to listen to children more, and you know, as a whole, children need to be considered more, not just adults making all these decisions. Yeah, as you were saying that um, before, when you were just sort of saying, you know, children can't vote. I was thinking it's really up to the adults in a child's life. Mm. to be speaking on their behalf. And I think, yeah, yes. even as um, believers, we hear that phrase about being a voice for the voiceless. And, again, it is that space, um, particularly when you start looking at out-of-home care, where you, I mean, advocacy, that word comes up often, doesn't it, where yes. you're actually yep. advocating on behalf of somebody who doesn't have a voice of their yes. own. And really, I guess what Anne's also saying is that extends out even beyond out-of-home care and into this age bracket of young mm. people in our country so that's yeah. really interesting to think about. And and I think that's where like children that that comment children who aren't who are who are not heard or who are silenced can't be protected and I think that is as foster carers that's where our or you know kin carers as carers that's our role becomes to be that voice for them. Mm. Exactly that. The adv- the advocating for them and making sure that we're that we're getting involved where we can. Yes. To advocate for our kids. Yeah. Um so that they're not silenced. Um, she also said we talk a lot about children at risk, but we don't talk a lot about those that are not at risk enough. Hmm. So those that are just on the fringes, that we know that they're on the borderline of 
Um, the department have kind of got them in their sights, but they're not at risk enough to remove them. But we need to be looking at how do we put more supports in for those children and those families and how do we support those that are not at risk enough. enough. It's almost like um, a, a preventative strengthening families kind yeah. of approach, isn't it? So, yeah. hey, if we, and I know um, I've heard our agency kind of talk a bit about, they've got some programs, which is that preventative kind of infrastructure that comes around an at-risk family. Yes. And doing all that they can to, yeah, I guess, support and help that family stay together. So it would yes. be interesting to know from policy point of views, you know, what, what is already out there you know, yes. that people are rolling out already in care and how effective that is. Like if you are supporting a family, what the outcomes are, like are they better where there's, mm -hmm. you know, in the long run does that mean that often it doesn't end up with removal or, yeah, I'll have to ask Stacey mm. about that and find out what kind yeah. of research <laughs> has been done around that. It's yes, because I think, you know, it's great that we have foster carers and, and carers and we're going to continue to need them. Mm. But actually what's better is if we can put in all of that support to help families to to change and to raise their children. Yes. Because we know that those outcomes are going to be better. Yes, and it's um, almost like, um, you know, I think you've probably mentioned her as well, uh, Jamie Finn over in the States where she talks about fostering a family. It's almost like the... Um, the fostering a family before the family, before there's actually removal. Like if that family yes. is open, and I think that's probably the, the sticky point or the hard point, sometimes it's the removal which then opens up the receptivity, isn't it, to being yeah. influenced by outside influences. But if there is a way that, yeah, you could encourage or um, show families how it could be beneficial before, then there's, yeah, it's a really good space to think about. And mm. hmm. what, what did you do, take away from that personally? Well, I, I do worry sometimes that we've become too isolated in our parenting and in our, in our lifestyles in general. Yeah. And so when, I mean, you know, probably back in my grandmother's day, there were family around her who would support and, you know, I've got the privilege of, like, I've got two daughters who've got babies and so and we're in that proximity where we're part of their village. But I think we need to recognise there's a lot of families that don't have that, either through dysfunction or through um, geographical, you know, people that just don't have any family. I yes. mean, we, we raised our children with no family here um, as such. And so that's hard because you, you're, trying to, you're trying to do everything. I mean, I had people that uh, could teach me how to parent mm -hmm. so I did have a village but we didn't have um we didn't have close family and that that had its challenges at times particularly when your village is made up of people who are all going through the same thing at the same time yes because your capacity is limited if you're in the same season yeah. aren't you yeah mm. yeah and um and so I think that we need to think more about how we reach those families who don't have and particularly you know I think a bit of a burden for me is our is our young women that are coming through the foster care system and then who find themselves in that same dysfunctionality and um and find themselves pregnant and then and then you know the department generally removes the babies and you go is that really the right way to do it like should we not be looking at how do we how do we support mum and a baby and mm. give them that opportunity but not just go okay well let's see how they go and put them out there all by themselves this is the spotlight and we've been listening to part of a conversation between Terry and Kirsty from Faith and Fostering with some highlights from the recent National Foster Care Conference. You can hear the full episode in the free Vision app. Just tap the podcast tab and search in the Faith and Fostering channel for the episode, A Peek into the National Foster Care Conference. There are many more episodes of Faith and Fostering in the Vision app with new ones added each week. My name is Jen Spiker. Join me next time on The Spotlight as I share another podcast or video worth highlighting. For more great podcasts and videos like the one featured today, check out vision.org.au or the free Vision app.